Hey guys, so here we are. Last time we talked about uh, how magnetic fields arise from currents. This time I want to uh, focus specifically on loops of current. And this makes sense because uh, that's how you usually find currents in loops. Um, we did talk about a long straight wire. I'll come back to this in a moment. Um, but you think about lab, well, of course in lab, we always had this big tangled mess of wires kind of like place mixing up. Um, but uh, you can make pretty easily loops of current by just laying a wire down in a circle or even an approximately a square. Um, in fact, you can just get, you know, I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, anyway, I do, I want to make sure I, I point out here, you got the, the specular highlight on my bolt spot because I turned a light on up there. So you're all thinking, wow, he's old. Mm, you're, you're not wrong. Anyway, so from last time, this was the magnetic field around a long wire. Um, and just to remind you how this works, um, let's start with the picture in the upper left here. So that little I labeled, that's a circle with a dot. That means the current is coming out of the page. And the way you can figure out the magnetic field around a long wire is you get out your right hand. This is my right hand. And I, I point my thumb along the direction of the current, and then my fingers will curl around in the direction of the current. So you can see that the arrows follow that direction there. The magnetic field gets weaker as you go farther away. And I also cheated a little bit the way I drew these arrows. Usually we draw the tail of the arrow at the position where we're figuring out the field, but it, it looked better if I drew it at the center. So I drew the center of the arrows at the position of the field. Um, so you see it's dropping off. And the equation in the middle here, B is mu naught I over two pi R, that tells you the strength of the magnetic field. So use your right hand rule for the direction. There's the strength, mu naught is a fundamental constant. I gave you the value last time, you can go look it up on the previous notes. On the bottom left is the same diagram, except it's a field line diagram. So the field line diagram is prettier, but a little bit harder to interpret. What, the, what you can do is any point, you find the field line that tells you the direction of the magnetic field, but it doesn't tell you the magnitude. Whereas on the upper left, the vector field, the arrow at a given point tells you both the direction and the magnitude. So it's it's not as pretty, but it, there's more information in it. And then on the right, it's the same picture as the upper left, only I've rotated the whole thing 90 degrees so that now the current is going vertically. So once again, get my right hand out. And so the current is going that way. And so it curls around. So on the right side here, you will notice that the current is into the page. That's those X's. And over on the left side, the current is out of the page, so that's the circles with the dots. And once again, you see that it's bigger, closer to the wire. So that is visualizing the same thing as the upper left picture is visualizing. It's just this field around a wire. Well, all right, so what you can do is you can start with this field around a long wire and then use that to figure out what's the field going to be in a little current loop. Um, and to start with, let's not actually make a real current loop but let's just lay down four long wires like this. So you've got um, two long wires that are horizontal, one with the current on the bottom here, the current is going to the right, and then on the top, the current is going to the left, and we've placed them a distance A apart. And then two other wires, there's one over here on the left with the current going down, and one over here on the right with the current going up. So those are just four long wires. We're going to use the principle of superposition, which works for magnetic fields just like electric fields. And we're going to figure out what is the electric field at the center of this square that's made where the four wires overlap each other. So remember, the principle of superposition means you just figure out the magnetic field from each wire, and then you add all of them up to get the total magnetic field. So up in the left here, I have my axes, x, y, and z. So we can use that. If you use your right hand rule, let's start with the wire on the right. So starting with the wire on the right, get your right hand out, notice the currents that way, curl my fingers and oh look, over on this side, it's gonna be out of, out of the page. And now if I go over to the wire on the left, so over here on the left, the currents that way, curl my fingers, oh look, it's out of the page. And if I do the wire on the top, um, it's going, is it going that way? No, it's going that way. Um, there's this weird mirror thing that goes on with my camera that makes this hard for point my thumb in the right direction, left and right. It's going that way. And so if I bend my hand right, it's curling out of the page. And then the one on the bottom is going that way, right? So I curl my fingers, it's coming out of the page. So all four of them are coming out of the page. Also, this point at the center is a distance of A over two away from all four wires. 
So that means that the magnetic field from all four of them, same direction, same magnitude, it's going to be the same. We can use the equation mu naught i over 2 pi r. And in this case, r, the distance from the wire to the place where we want to have the field is a over 2. So I just multiply mu naught i over 2 pi times a over 2. So those two twos cancel there. I'm left with 4 mu naught i over pi a. And then the direction of the magnetic field is the z hat direction, just from my axes up here. I've defined z hat as out of the page, and we figured out from the right hand rule that it's out of the page. So that's what you would get if you had four infinitely long wires. Um, what's the magnetic field right at the middle? Well, now, so that we could figure out. It's harder to figure out, and we don't actually have the math in this class to figure it out, but it is possible to figure out. Go ask. Um, I don't think Owen has had ENM yet, but if if you can find Jess or Jake, who I think tutored or Jake, yeah, certainly you can go find Jake. I don't know how you're going to find him since nobody's allowed to leave their house anymore. But um, find Jake and ask him, hey, how do I actually calculate it for a real square of loop? And and if he looks at you funny, use the words bo savar and see what he says. If you really calculate it, you get this. So if you compare this equation to the equation on the previous slide, there I had four mu naught i over pi a. Here I have two times the square root of two. And 2 times the square root of 2 is 2.8, right? So it's closer to 3. So it's a little bit smaller. And that makes sense because there's not as much wire there. But it's pretty close. So you saw by pretending it was four infinite wires overlapped, we got pretty close to the magnetic field right at the center of this little loop of wire. So all right, so if you have a little, this is a loop. It's a, a square. Eventually, we'll get the circles of wire, which is a little more natural. It's just easier to figure out the magnetic field. In this case, you have a little squared loop of current at the center. That's going to be the strength and direction of the magnetic field. Now, again, um, before I did the right hand rule on each leg, there's a shorthand thing you can do here, and that is get out your right hand again and then curl your fingers around in the direction of the current. Right. So at the top, it's going that way. At the bottom, it's going that way. On the right, it's sorry, on the left, it's going down and on the right, it's going up. And then your thumb will point along the direction of the magnetic field, which is out of the page. Well, all right. So that's the magnetic field right at the center. What about at other places? Well, if we want to do the magnetic field out off to the right side of the loop, we use the principle of superposition again. So again, use your right hand rule um, for the right and left wires. Again, if I get out my right hand, I, I point my hand um, along. So the right wire, thumb along the direction. If I curl my hands around, you notice it's into the page over to the right of it. So that's going to be to the right. Then for the left wire, so now I have to orient my thumb over here, out here. If I curl it all the way around, oh, look, it's out of the page on the right side. So the right and the left will tend to cancel each other out. But notice it's closer to the right wire than to the left wire. So that vector is going to be bigger than the left wire. So they won't completely cancel each other out. So you'll be left with some magnetic field into the page. So now let's do the top and the bottom wires. So let's start with the bottom wire. Sorry, the bottom wire has current going that way. And you'll notice that above the bottom wire, it's out of the page. OK, so that's why I have the little dot there. And then for the top wire, the current's going that way. And oh, look, below, it's also out of the page. So top and bottom are both out of the page. Top and bottom are going to have the same magnitude. And then if you think about distances, um, the top and the bottom, well, the centers of those wires are further from the field point than the right wire is. So those are going to have a smaller magnitude. And it will work out. And here, I'm going to tell you this from what we've done so far. You couldn't necessarily figure this out. But if you actually had the equations for it, or if you um, pretended they were four infinitely long wires again, you could try and get the same answer. But um, yeah, you might get in trouble doing that. But anyway. Um, if you actually really use the equation for it, you would work out the magnitudes add up such that the leftover magnetic field is into the page here. So what I just did, I wanted to figure out the magnetic field at this point off to the right of the loop. Um, I thought about what's the magnetic field from the right wire. And I figured out, oh, it's into the page. And it's close to that wire, so it's going to be big. The left wire, I figured out it's out of the page, but it's far from that wire. So it's going to be small. So that's why I drew this little O dot small. And then the top and bottom wires, I figure out they're both out of the page. And then I sum those four up, I will get something into the page. And so that's what the magnetic field looks like there. Now, there's a symmetry here. You will notice off to the right, if I had um, tried to figure out the magnetic field at any of these other three positions here, the considerations would have been exactly the same, right? We're going to be off to the side. We're going to be closest to um, 
one side and farthest from the other, I could have done exactly the same thing and I would have gotten exactly the same answer. But there's actually another way you could think about this is that if I started with the picture from the previous page and I just rotate that picture by 90 degrees, when I'm done, the current loop will look exactly like it did when I started, right? You'll have a square with current going around counterclockwise, but I will have rotated the little X of the magnetic field from the right side to the top side. So, or to the bottom side, depending on which way you went. So I rotate the, the whole picture. The current looks exactly the same. So, okay, so the magnetic field there is gonna have to be what I got when I rotated the picture. That's just a symmetry argument there. So that's what the magnetic field would look like um, off to the side of this current loop. Now, so far, all we've talked about is the, the plane of the loop, right? So we have not offset in Z at all. If the loop is in z equals zero, then all these little um, x's and dots that I've drawn for the vectors are also at z equals zero. So they're at z equals zero. This is an important thing to make sure you do not conflate. The position of the field is z equals zero. But notice at the center here, the field vector has a positive z, and then outside the field vectors have a negative z. So at z equals zero, the z component of the b field is positive inside the loop, negative outside the loop. If you didn't understand that sentence, go back, listen to it again, it makes sense. If you understand what we mean when we're talking about a vector field, that sentence makes sense. If it doesn't, talk to me because you need to be able to understand that because it's central to absolutely everything we're doing. So, okay, so that's in the plane of the loop. Let's now think about it out of the plane of the loop. And now this gets a little harder because things are all up at different directions. So what I wanna do is at first, I wanna start off on the right here. I wanna think about a point that is oriented, um, let's say, directly above, and by above I mean in the plus z direction, the right loop. And so I'm, what I'm trying to draw in my little 3D current loop here is that y is into the page. So this right side is, is going into the page. So if I use my right hand rule, you know, once again, over here on the, um, on, on the right side, I have it going into the page. I could work out, and you notice above it, there would be a magnetic field to the right. So from this right loop, I get a magnetic field that is, um, or sorry, yeah, from the right leg at this point up here, I get a magnetic field that is to the right. And then if I do the left loop and I do the right hand rule, I would get the same thing, except it'll be off at some angle like this and it's gonna be smaller because it's farther from the left leg. And if I do the top and bottom legs, I will discover, and this isn't exactly right, but it's pretty close. I'll discover that the top and bottom legs are approximately in and out of the page. That's why I have this mostly down here. But in any event, they will cancel themselves out. So if I do the vector sum of the right leg plus the left leg, um, the vector sum will come off to this angle like this, and that's why I've drawn this here. And then on the left side, if I did exactly the same um, symmetry uh, sort of thing, if I did all the same stuff, or you can do one of these symmetry arguments where rotate the whole thing by 180 degrees around the z-axis, that will not change the current loop because the current loop will look exactly the same, but it'll rotate this vector over to this vector. And so from that argument, you can say that they're the same. But in any event, if you work it out, you'll discover that this is gonna have to be off in this direction. And if you just look at it from the symmetry, it sort of works out that it's gonna have to be like that. So you could then do this exercise for all points in space to figure out what is the vector field around a little loop of current. So what I've got here, I've made a little 3D rendering. There's a little loop of current, and we've gone to a circular loop of current just because um, those are more regular, and I like them better. It's harder to think about a little bit, but I'm going to do that. And so if you just look at this, well, so what we have inside the loop of current, you will notice that the magnetic field is pointing in the upward direction, and actually clo closer to the wires, it's stronger than it is right at the center. And then outside the field, they're pointing in the downward direction, and it drops off, the, the magnitude drops off very, sh very sharply with distance. It starts pretty close here, and it gets smaller, very small here. It's so flat, you just barely even see the little arrow length. Um, so this, these directions are what we figured out before, right? Because we were looking at it like this. So we figured out at the center here, it's pointing out and over here, we figured out it was pointing it down into the page. So that's what we did before. But now if you look at it from this angle, um, this is what it looks like. That's the magnetic field. And then you may remember up into the right, we looked at the magnetic field and it was pointing off at an angle like this, up to the left, an angle like this, right? And it's, well, it's hard to see it. So I'm gonna do another thing 
momentarily to show you what it looks like. But you can just see here, this what I'm going to do. Notice how much stronger the magnetic field is inside the loop than it is. You know, it's reasonably strong just outside the loop, but you get even a little bit farther away from the loop. And it's a really much weaker magnetic field than it is in the middle of the loop. So what I've done here is I've just rescaled the sizes of the arrows so you can see the field outside a little bit better. I've also not drawn the, the arrows very close to an inside the loop because they would have been giant and made the whole thing really tough to look at. Um, so here's the first of all, along the axis of the loop. So this is a line that goes right through the center of the loop. You notice that the magnetic field is always pointing in the plus y direction. Right? I zoom out here, right? So the direction of the current is around like that. You could have used your right hand roll to figure out. So along the axis of the current, it's always pointing directly in the plus y direction. In the plane of the current loop, and that's what we did before, outside it's always pointing in the minus. So, well, is it y or z? Whatever. It's point, let's call this z because that's what I called it before. So along the axis, it's pointing in the plus z direction. Um, in the plane of the loop, outside it's pointing in that direction, right? So if the current's going around this way, if you used your right hand rule, you could figure this out. Outside it's going down. Above it, look, it's off at that angle, just like we said. If you did the same thing below, you will notice it's at an angle like that. And then everywhere else, it's, it's at some other angle. Um, well, okay. So you could take this, and what you could do is just connect these arrows together. So as the arrows go out, draw from one arrow, connect to the X arrow, connect, 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 connect. And when you're done connecting all these arrows together, you would get... Um, one of these field line diagrams. So you've got this loop of current here in the center, and then these lines. So notice along the axis of the loop, the magnetic field points entirely vertically. Um, and then off to the side, they loop around sort of like the magnetic field loops around a wire, but then because it's looping around this circle, the whole thing adds together and gets a little more complicated. And so the fields are not nice and regular circles, but they get stretched out like this. Um, so that's one way of visualizing the um, field around a, a, the magnetic field around a current loop. Now, of course, up to now, we've been um, just drawing the field in the XY plane or the XZ plane, rather, um, assuming X is left, right, Z is up, down, um, because it's easier to draw if you only draw two dimensions, but space is three dimensions and the field is everywhere in space. So this is an attempt to visualize the field everywhere in space. We start the current loop, the current's going around in this direction, and um, at the center, you have it this way. And then on in the plane of the current, it turns out everywhere in the plane of the current, the magnetic field is going to be perfectly vertical. Um, and, and so you notice at all of these positions, it's vertical. And then as you go outside the loop, they start to be vertical, but in the downwards direction, if you're in the plane of the loop. And as you get farther away, whichever direction you go, it stays downward, um, but it gets much weaker. So once again, I'm going to rescale all of the arrows so that you can see the arrows outside the loop. So I'm no longer drawing the things inside or very close because they would have been giant, right? And so this is what the magnetic field looks like in 3D, right? So you'll see up here and above, it's kind of spreading out like a little bundle of flowers or something here. And down below, they're all pointing back up in. So, you know, if you traced it around, you'd get like this, but you could do this in any direction. So the full 3D field li like this, it has a lot of symmetry and it looks nice. So the whole 3D field looks something like this, which really is just the extension of the 2D. If you looked at it straight on, we drew the 2D, but now you can see the whole thing in three dimensions. And again, the current's going around in this direction here. Um, so that's what the magnetic field looks like around a loop of current. Okay, so all of that was for a loop of current. Um, but it turns out, and I mentioned this last time, that a loop of current is approximately a magnetic dipole. And if you make the loop of current really, really, really small, so it's just a little tiny loop of current there, um, it's a really good approximation. Or if you're very far away from the loop of current, so with, what does a really small loop of current mean? It means that the distance you are away from the loop is much larger than the radius of the loop. So same thing. If you're really far from the loop of current, the field is a magnetic dipole dipole field. And I talked about that last time. So what does the field look like? That's everything that we've just been doing. You can define the magnetic dipole moment of a current loop. Now, why are we going to do this? Because later we're going to want to be able to talk about magnetic dipoles without worrying about whether or not it's an actual little current loop there or not. Um, 
how do you really make a magnetic dipole? With a little current loop. It's just like, how do you make an electric dipole with two point charges? Um, but then we talked about the electric dipole, the field outside an electric dipole, um, which would have been the same as talking about, oh, let's just sum up the field from these two charges, but it's worth thinking about the dipole by itself. So we're going to talk about uh, magnetic dipoles here. So the magnetic dipole moment, this is a new quantity that we're defining. The magnetic dipole moment, what's the word moment? It's a technical term. Don't worry about it. Just take this as an idiom, as a definition. Um, M vector, so the magnetic dipole moment is a vector quantity, um, is the dipole moment. We define the dipole moment according to the right-hand rule. So once again, you've got a current loop, and the current is going around in a direction like this. Curl your fingers around the direction. Your thumb points in the direction of the dipole moment. So the dipole is along the axis um, of the current loop. So that's the direction of it. Here's the magnitude of it. I is the um, current running through the wire. A is the area encompassed by the loop. So here, this is a circular loop of radius r, so the area encompassed by the loop is just pi r squared. And then n hat is just a unit vector perpendicular to the area. It's traditional to use n for normal. Normal means perpendicular. Just remember the normal force from first semester is perpendicular to the plane of contact. Um, so that so the direction is perpendicular to the area that is inscribed by the little current loop. So that's the magnetic dipole moment of a current loop. And then you could um, use that with some other equations that are more complicated than anything we'll do in this course. Um, although the truth is you could understand them. If you're interested, uh, Google magnetic dipole moment and go to the Wikipedia page. That the You can find the equation there. It's got some dot products and stuff on it. You can understand it. It's just a little more involved than we'll bother with in this course. Incidentally, that that is how um, I'll show you actually. In fact, let's do this now. Here's another visualization with arrows at different positions where I actually used the dipole field equations. Uh, and it looks pretty much the same as before, except the arrows are in different positions. Um, I don't draw it right along the axis here. Um, I didn't calculate it for this loop of current. I calculated it for a magnetic dipole orient right at the center of this loop. I still have the loop here, but really this is for a magnetic dipole at the center. Well, it looks pretty much the same. You'll notice on the outside it curves around like this, comes back up below like this. Um, I don't have it in the plane, but if you kind of zoom in, it's, it's hard to tell here, but you'll notice it's going at an angle down into the left here and down into the right here. So in between in the plane, it's going to be straight vertical like that. Um, here all the arrows overlap each other because they were just too big. Um, so you know, a magnetic dipole field, but it looks pretty much the same, at least qualitatively as the current loop. If you were to compare them quantitatively to each other, you would discover that as the loop gets bigger, there are some differences uh, between the magnetic dipole field and the loop. And if I put the arrows in different positions, you can see one of these differences. First of all, I have not plotted the magnetic field right at the center because, um, again, this is not for this loop. It's for dipole right at the center. It turns out you divide by zero if you try and plot it there, so I didn't even plot it. Along the axis, you notice it's vertical. But here's the thing. Notice these arrows are inside the loop, but pointing down. That's because I didn't do the field for this loop of current. I did the field for a dipole right at the center. Everywhere outside the dipole, it points down. So that is one difference. Remember before when we did the loop of current, the magnetic fields everywhere inside the loop were pointing up. So the loop of current is approximately a dipole at its center, but not exactly. We can also connect this back to last time I told you about the magnetic field inside a solenoid. So remember, when we are looking at the magnetic field of a loop of current, that outside the loop of current, the magnetic field was very small compared to the magnetic field inside the loop of current. If you stack a whole bunch of loops of current on top of each other, which is really what a solenoid is, inside you get this uniform magnetic field. So here's another thing that's different. Remember, with a single loop of current, the magnetic field was stronger, closer to the wires than it was right at the center. In a, mag in a solenoid here, it's uniform everywhere. And if the solenoid's really freaking long, it turns out that the magnetic field outside the solenoid works out to be exactly zero. Um, and right here's the magnitude of the magnetic field. And again, you use the right hand rule, get out your right hand, make sure it's the right one, curl your fingers around so it's into the page over on that side, out of the page on this side. Curl your fingers around along the current, your thumb points in the direction of the magnetic field. So that was the solenoid from last time.
Well, okay. So we've been talking about dipole fields. We've been talking about dipole magnetic fields. And what is the magnetic field of a little loop of current? And hey, it's a, it's a dipole field, um, especially if the current loop is small. But if you've ever played with magnetic fields before, sometimes you do this in, in even elementary or middle school or high school science classes, you play with magnets and you look at the fields and maybe one thing you did was you took uh, a bunch of iron filings and you shook them loose um, around a magnet and you looked at how the iron filings all lined up and you saw, hey, look, this is that, that field shape that we saw. Well, you may also know that the Earth has a magnetic field and the Earth's magnetic field is to decent approximation of dipole field. Now there's other complications here that come into this. Um, one of them is that the sun, the sun is important. The sun in our solar system shines light, but one of the other things it does is it's emitting a stream of charged particles at all times. So there's these charged particles moving through the solar system. That's one of the complicated things for astronauts who might want to fly to Mars is that the radiation is actually pretty high in space. Um, and then if there's a solar flare, the radiation can get higher. And so um, astronauts will have to think about this if they want to um, fly far. Why does this radiation not just fry us on Earth? Well, two things. One, Earth's atmosphere actually intercepts a bunch of these charged particles and stops them from getting to us. But also, crucially, Earth's magnetic field, it turns out, captures and traps a lot of these particles and protects us. So yay magnetic field. It's not just for compasses. Um, well, okay, so the Earth does have a magnetic field and it looks like a dipole field. So you can see this is the same kind of shape as that dipole field that we drew before. Um, the Earth's magnetic field is actually not exactly aligned with um, the Earth's axis. So here he says geographic North Pole, so right, right there, geographic North Pole, that's where Santa lives. And then geographic South Pole down here, right, is the exact South Pole station. Uh, we actually, there's a scientific research station right at the South Pole, but, you know, Antarctica's down there. So that's the axis the Earth rotates around. The magnetic field is tilted slightly relative to the geographic North Pole, which is why magnetic compasses don't exactly tell you north. Um, and the, far, the closer you get to the North Pole, the worse they are. Uh, but, you know, it's really pretty close. So the, the Earth's magnetic field is slightly misaligned from its rotation, which is kind of interesting, but there it is. Um... <clears throat> so then you've got the Earth's magnetic field sort of looks like this. It's a dipole field around the Earth. If you think about it, um, you'll notice if you're on the surface of the Earth, it's like just another one of these areas that's a little closer. You notice that the direction of the magnetic field is pointing um, along the surface towards the North. And so that's why if you have a little compass, you can um, get the compass to line up with a magnetic field. Well, all right, so the magnet you, that you may have played with before is a bar magnet. And here's what the um, field of a bar magnet looks like. And in fact, it turns out that the bar magnet has field is the same as the field of a bunch of stacks of current loops. So where does the magnetic field of a bar magnet come from? First, I do want to point out um, if you actually draw these field lines, you'll notice that they come out of the north, they go around, they come back in the south, um, and then make complete loops like this. Um, so the north pole and the magnetic field points along that direction, which means I think on this previous slide, I think this slide labeled, I think the Earth's comes out of the north, goes into the south. I think, I'll have to think about that. I think they've labeled, I think the Earth's south I think the Earth's north magnetic pole is actually a south pole. But anyway, don't worry too much about the north and south designation because it does get confusing when you talk about the Earth. Um, better to think about current loops, right? Well, all right, are there current loops? I mean, this is a bar magnet. It's a hunk of iron that's been magnetized somehow. Um, how does that work? Why does it have a magnetic field? If the source of magnetic field is moving charges and... Um, currents are moving charges. And then if you have current, it's got to be a complete circuit. So you're going to have a current loop somewhere. Where are the current loops? And it turns out the current loops are in the atoms. Here's a classical model of an atom. Now, this red text here, atoms don't really look like this. That's actually very important. We will talk about, I mean, also look like is a little tough because atoms are so small that the they are uh, compro so like smaller than the wavelength of 
light that you see. So what does it mean to look at an atom? That's even a hard question. But the positions of the electron in space is nothing like this. This is a classical model, but we're going to go with it for now. And in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about this a little bit later. A classical model of an atom, you have the nucleus here, which is a positive charge, and it's not moving. Then you have an electron that's orbiting the nucleus, and it orbits, let's just pretend it orbits in a circle for now. Um, notice that if I use my right-hand rule, the direction of the orbit, you would expect the magnetic dipole moment to be that way, but electrons are negative. So the current is in the opposite direction of the electron motion, and so that's why the um, magnetic field is down. Now, there's something important about this. The electron has to be in an outer orbital. You may remember from a chemistry class, SPDF orbitals, eh, whatever. Again, we'll talk about this a little more in a couple of weeks. If you have a hydrogen atom, the electron orbits without angular momentum. It doesn't actually circle the hydrogen atom, and so there's no dipole moment with that. And that's so we'll come back to that. But there are some electron orbitals that do have angular momentum and will behave like current loops. And in particular, they have magnetic dipole moments associated with them. Um, so electrons in atoms, if they're in the right kind of orbital, will behave like current loops, at least enough so that you will get magnetic fields from them. So atoms all by themselves have magnetic dipole moments, some of them, um, and therefore will have magnetic fields. Actually, it turns out that an electron all by itself has a dipole moment. Electrons have angular momentum. So if you imagine it's a little blue circle, it's supposed to be the electron here. Um, it has angular momentum. Now, is the electron rotating? Again, when you get down to sizes of electrons, quantum mechanics, that's not necessarily the right way to talk about it. The only way really safe is to say it is it has angular momentum. But it behaves sort of. And we'll talk later about why this, what's wrong with talking about it like this, but it behaves sort of like a little ball of charge rotating in this direction. So you get a dipole moment that way. So electrons have a little dipole moment. And here it is. Notice it's 10 to the minus 24 Coulomb meter squared per second. If you compare that to the, um, so imagine a current of one amp, which is a pretty big current. Remember the currents you've measured in the lab tend to be milliamps, right? Um, if you have a current of one amp and a big old loop of current that's one, I, the screen's too small, big old loop of current that's one meter, um, one square meter in area, so divide that by um, two pi, you'll get the radius, and actually it probably is something like that. Um, that would be one Coulomb meter squared per second would be the dipole moment of that. So, okay, if you have a little current loop um, whose radius is, uh, or let's say, yeah, whose radius is something like, I don't know, 0.05, meters and you square that and you multiply by um, 2 pi, you're going to get something like 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2 if it's a 1 amp current, which is big. Coulomb meter squared per second. Here we have 10 to the minus 24. Really, 9 times 10 to the minus 24 is approximately 10 to the minus 23, right? Because 9 is almost 10. Um, so the magnetic dipole of the mo moment of the electron is really small, but it's real. And if you're in a material where you have one of two things, either you have an electron that's in an orbital that has angular momentum. Now, what happens is you have lots of electrons, and they tend to be in orbitals where some are rotating one way and some are rotating the other way, and the angular momentum and therefore the dipole moments will all tend to cancel each other out. Likewise, you might have heard about electrons being paired in orbitals. If you've ever taken a chemistry class and you've heard about the Pauli exclusion principle, electrons are paired in orbitals, and they're paired in such a way that their dipole moments cancel each other out. So um, often, all these dipole moments of the electron orbitals and all the dipole moments of the electrons themselves cancel each other out. Um, but if you have a leftover electron, so easiest example, hydrogen, one leftover electron, it's going to have a magnetic dipole moment just because of the electron itself. Now, it turns out the nucleus also has a magnetic dipole moment. You may have heard of nuclear magnetic resonance, which is using that kind of stuff. Um, so depending on what material you have, what, what species on the periodic table that you have, where the electrons are, where they are in their orbitals, is there an unpaired electron that has a dipole moment? Is there an electron in an orbital that doesn't have another orbital going the opposite way to cancel it out? You could have atoms that have permanent dipole moments. And iron, 
is sort of the classic example. Iron, each iron atom has a permanent dipole moment. And what happen, what it turns out is, is that um, in the lowest energy state, iron, the dipole moments of neighboring atoms all like to line up with each other. Now, um, just so you can imagine the lowest energy state of, of a bunch of marbles sitting on a trampoline is all the marbles that rest on the trampoline. And if you put energy in the system, vibrate the trampoline, the marbles are going to bounce up and down and they're going to roll around and all kinds of stuff, right? So uh, putting energy in a system just means heating it up. And because materials are not all at absolute zero, um, things get stirred up. And uh, that will tend to make things not line up as perfectly as they would. But in iron, stuff tries to line up with each other. What ends up happening in a ferromagnetic material, jargon term, ferro, ferrous iron, right? So in a material whose magnetic properties are like those of iron, that's what ferromagnetic really means. What ends up happening is you get these magnetic domains where not all, but lots of the atoms dipole moments are all kind of lined up in the same direction. Um, but then you have another domain where they're all lined up together and you'll have these domain boundaries where they all lined up this way here and they all lined up that way there. But then when the two came to each other, they couldn't sort of decide, oh, I'm, we're all going to flip to match you. And so you get these domains and they're all in kind of different directions. And generally they, um, will all be in all different directions. And so a chunk of iron will have no net magnetic dipole moment. So that's why you get a random chunk of iron or other metal that's magnetic it's not a magnet. It doesn't have a magnetic field associated with it normally. It does turn out on the microscopic level that um, there are big bunches of atoms that are all lined up with each other, but then there are neighboring bunches of atoms that are lined up in different directions, and all the various different directions all tend to cancel each other out. However, if you do things to the metal, and one thing to do it is put it in a strong magnetic field, so you may have, uh, this is something you do in a uh, uh, elementary school or middle school science classes sometimes, or maybe you just did it for fun, take a nail that's not magnetized, get a bar magnet and rub the bar magnet along the nail repeatedly. What you're doing is exerting forces on all those little atoms that tends to get them rotating uh, and lined up. And if you can, and then you'll magnetize the nail and then the nail can pick up paper clips and stuff like that. So if you get a material and you magnetize it, really what's happening is you have all these little domains they start to line up with each other. And if you have two domains pointing in the same direction, they'll merge, basically become one domain, because what's the difference? If you have two domains next to each other in the same direction, it might as well be one domain. You'll get a few domains that dominate, and those domains roughly point all in the same direction. Um, it's, it's hard, especially at room temperature, to perfectly magnetize something. But as long as you have um, a number of domains that are all in the same direction, and then all the rest can be random, you'll end up with a permanent dipole moment. Um, and so that's how you make what we call permanent magnets. You can buy a magnet, permanent magnet. It's some sort of ferromagnetic material where they've managed to get all of the domains. And again, one domain is a chunk where lots of the atoms are all lined up so that their magnetic moments point in the same direction. And you get all the domains, or at least lots of the domains, with all their magnetic moments pointing in the same direction and you'll get a permanent magnet. All right, so it's worth comparing magnetic dipoles to electric dipoles, because um, they're similar in some ways and different in other ways. So on the left, we have an electric dipole. Uh, remember the way we made an electric dipole is you have a positive charge and a negative charge. And so there's two poles. And then the field outside the pole here kind of wraps around the way um, the way we've talked about before. Well, outside a magnetic dipole, so it's a bar magnet, has a dipole field, or this could be a stack, not an infinite solenoid, but a short solenoid, stack of loops of current, and outside it wraps around exactly the same like the electric dipole. Um, well, okay, but well, inside it's different. You notice inside, you go from the plus um, charge to the minus charge, the electric field points from the plus to the minus, but here in the magnetic, you don't get that. You don't have a field. So the notice the field outside comes out of the North Pole, goes around, comes into the South Pole, but it doesn't point from North to South inside. The field lines make these complete loops. So that's something that's different about a magnetic dipole that, as compared to a electric dipole. Here's the other thing. If I take an electric dipole that's positive on one side and negative on the other, and I break it apart and I pull the two things far apart from each other, well, 
One side is the positive side. Now I'll just have a regular electric field around a point charge pointing away. And the other side is the negative side. And so now I have a regular electric field pointing towards the negative charge in all, in all places. If I break apart a bar magnet, I don't get an isolated North Pole or an isolated South Pole. There is no such thing as a magnetic monopole, right? What's monopole? Well, dipole, di, two, mono, one. There's no magnetic monopoles out there. Yeah, there's some particle physics things that suggest that maybe they should exist and they'd be weird, interesting particles, but we've never detected any. And certainly in terms of the classical physics that we're talking about, there's no magnetic monopoles. It just doesn't happen. Uh, and that's why we started with electric fields talking about the field of a point charge. We did not start magnetic fields that way because they don't even exist. So if you break apart a bar magnet, what you get is two shorter bar magnets. And they will have a... Uh, you know, a smaller total magnetic field because you've, you've taken away some of the atoms that were contributing to the dipole moment. But you have two dipole moments. So notice you break apart, you create sort of a south pole in the middle and a north pole in the middle of the other one, which is why talking about the poles for magnets is a little sketchy. You can talk about the poles of a dipole moment because you really can make it with two point charges. You can't make a, di a magnetic dipole that way. Here's another way to think about, imagine that this bar magnet up here was a big stack of loops of current. Well, if you break it in half, over here you have the top half of loops, and over here you have the bottom half of loops. They're both still stacks of loops of current, so they're going to have fields that still look like this, something like that. All right, now I want to give you a few equations for the strength of the magnetic dipole. I'm not going to give you the equation. Again, if you want to see it, Wikipedia's got it. Look magnetic. Just look up magnetic dipole. You can find it. There's dot products. It's not so bad. If you want to find the field, I'm going to give you the field in two directions. So first, this is the fields from a dipole along the axis of the dipole. So it's very important here that you do not use this as the dipole field, because this is not the dipole field everywhere. On the bottom right here, it says these expressions are only good for z greater than zero. That's also important. Um, for z less than zero, the fields still point along the plus z direction. So this is specifically if you have a dipole, and let's say z is to the right here. Notice I have this arrow z to the right at the top here. z is to the right. You orient your dipole so that the dipole moment, so the electric dipole moment, remember we used d vector, is along the plus z direction. Or the magnetic dipole moment, and so you have this little loop of current, and there's the n hat vector, so the magnetic dipole is along the plus z direction. If that's the direction of the dipole, if you get, and this is only good, the, it's an approximation, but if you get reasonably far away from the dipole, how far away? Well, so that the distance between your two charges is small compared to how far away you are, or so that the radius of the current loop is small compared to how far away you are. So if you're pretty far away, the strength of the dipole drops off as 1 over z cubed. And here it is in terms of the dipole moment. Um, I mixed up my variables a little bit. Here I used p vector for the dipole moment. I used Oh no, I get, I'm sorry, d vector is the is not the dipole moment. d vector is the displacement from one thing to the other charge, from the negative to the positive charge. So the electric dipole, we used p vector. That's what we used before. So the electric dipole moment, p vector is just q, one of the charges times this displacement. Use that dipole vector. k is Coulomb's constant that we've used before, and z is the distance from the center of the dipole. So that's what this z arrow up here is labeled. That's the electric dipole field the electric field along the z-axis of a dipole pointing in the z-direction. That's for z greater than zero. For z less than zero, it turns out the magnitude is right. But this, if, if z was less than zero, uh, actually, this still works. I don't know why I'm saying it's only good for z greater than zero. Oh, no, here's the problem, because z cubed would be negative if z was less than zero. But the electric field should still be pointing in the same direction is the dipole moment. So this ex this equation doesn't work for z less than zero. Put a negative sign on it and it works. The point is, is that the electric field, both to the in the plus z and minus z directions, at those positions, the electric dipole field points in the plus z direction, even at the minus z positions. Likewise, magnetic field. Magnetic dipole divided by z cubed, and it's just a different constant out front. And down here, look, here are the constants that you want. Um, so that's the fields from a dipole here. You can use these equations to figure out the fields from a dipole along their axis. So this is only along the axis of the dipole. 
This isn't everywhere. That's one place. And here's one other place I'll tell it to you. So now I've oriented the z-axis vertical. Over here, here's the electric dipole moment. It's um, you know going up. And here's now I've oriented the current loop so that the magnetic field is or the magnetic dipole moment is up. And then the position in space is perpendicular to the axis. So this would be in the xy plane, like maybe along the x-axis. So if the z-axis is the direction of the dipole, here's along the x-axis. The electric field, a distance r away, and again, this is an approximation, and the approximation gets better the farther you are from the dipole, is minus k times the dipole moment over r cubed. So you will notice the minus sign here means um, it's in the opposite direction from the dipole, and that's what we saw when we were looking at all these before. Likewise, magnetic dipole. The magnetic dipole moment is up for a current loop like this. The magnetic field points down. So that's what this negative sign is, and it goes as the dipole moment over r cubed. So that's something that you can use um, perpendicular to the thing, but it's not everywhere. It's just perpendicular to uh, the dipole moment. So I've given you expressions so that you can figure out um, electric and magnetic fields outside dipoles in two places, either along the axis or here, perpendicular to the axis. Other places, more complicated. So don't use these as general expressions. Use these as decent expressions once you're pretty far away from the dipole in those two specific places. Well, okay, so um, that's all for this week. Um, before Monday, um, I will have uh, posted the regular video, right? So this lecture video is what's replacing what used to be lecture. There's still a video for Monday where I do some example problems. So watch that before Monday. And on Monday, I will post assignment 12, I think is what we're up to, whatever the assignment number is. I'll post the next assignment, and that'll be due by Wednesday at 5. So next time, the next Wednesday, I'll start talking about um, torques on current loops, and we'll get to generators and motors. But that's for the future. So that's all for now.